this is not a war picture, but it is a picture about ships that fight, and the men and women too, who keep them fighting in time of war and ready in time of peace. No Navy, anytime, anywhere, has ever been stronger than its support, the kind of support given by Navy Yards, properly located, properly manned, and properly efficient. This is the story of one such Navy Yard, the United States Navy Yard at Mare Island, California. Like other Navy Yards serving the fleet throughout the nation, Mare Island is well situated on the northeast arm of San Francisco Bay, one of the finest naval anchorages in the world. Mare Island's century-long history begins in 1854 with its first commandant, commander, later admiral, David Glasgow Farragut, hero of Mobile Bay. In 1855, the first dry dock and smithery were already hard at work. The USS St. Mary's, one of the first ships to use the sectional dry dock, and the Saginaw, first naval vessel built at Mare Island. In the 60s, the waterfront was a hive of activity. The frigate Independence served as receiving ship. Ships of foreign navies, like this Russian squadron, used the facilities of Mare Island. The waterfront in the 70s, with the town of Vallejo across the strait, in the days of wooden ships and iron men, and granite dry docks for the ships of the fleet. The first naval hospital appeared in 1870. The Spanish-American War saw the first graving basin, serving units of the Great White Fleet, like the Cheyenne, the old San Francisco, the Raleigh, and the Cincinnati. A room in the Commandant's quarters, 1904, and the same room today. The turn of the century brought a new kind of naval vessel to Mare Island, the submarine. The unique craft was the invention of John P. Holland, shown here with his earliest model, made in 1875. It was not a success. But nine models later, in 1900, he gave the world its first practical undersea boat. On the eve of World War I, Franklin D. Roosevelt was a distinguished visitor. And a few months later, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he saw the German U-boat come close to bringing Britain to her knees, a lesson he would remember well in a later greater war. In 1917, America got in it. Destroyers were needed to convoy troop ships across the Atlantic, and Mare Island was equal to the job. Workmen rolled up their sleeves, and in 17 days after her keel was laid, the destroyer ward was completed, launched, and ready for service. The same ship was destined to fire the first shot of World War II. But in 1917, the naval war was largely over when the United States joined battle against the Kaiser. Jutland, in 1916, had already sent a great part of the German fleet to the bottom. But the U.S. naval units did fine work in the North Atlantic. And when it was over, the young Prince of Wales, with his father, King George V, come aboard the United States ship New York, joining British Admiral Beatty and American Admiral Sims in watching the surrender of the German high fleet. Germany's main battle line, her dreadnoughts, armored cruisers, light cruisers, destroyers and auxiliaries, all are taken out into the North Sea by prize crews to be sunk by gunfire. It is a time for rejoicing, for Germany's threat to world peace, at least as a sea power, seems to be gone forever. Yet many of the American and British ships now at Scapa Flow, witnessing the death of German sea power, were 20 odd years later to test the might of resurgent German naval strength under a new kind of Kaiser called Der Führer. But all these things were in a future that looked anything but dark in 1918. The boys were glad to be home, and New York, with its wonderful skyline, was glad to have them back.
Into the North River steamed the victorious United States fleet. Admiral William S. Sims, commander of American naval operations in European waters, is given a hero's welcome. Navy Secretary Josephus Daniel, acting on Admiral Sims' advice, orders the fast-growing Navy divided into three separate fleets, Atlantic, Pacific, and Asiatic. Admiral Greaves commands the Asiatic fleet, while Admiral Rodman takes command of the Pacific squadrons. Admiral Henry Wilson assumes command of the Atlantic fleet, relieving Admiral Mayo. And as his flag is hauled down from the peak, the old Mare Island Commandant brings a brilliant naval career to a close and he bids goodbye to his staff. In 1919, the first battleship built at Mare Island was launched, fittingly named the California, soon to take her place in the newly formed Pacific Fleet, here sailing through the Panama Canal. The United States becomes at last a two-ocean naval power as this mighty fleet takes its station in the mightiest of oceans. There are already signs in the Far East that the Japanese Empire will bear watching. She has already occupied the German colonies in the Pacific and gives every indication of keeping them. Revolutionary as the submarine was the carrier, at last air power combined with sea power. As early as 1911, planes had been launched from a ship the battleship Pennsylvania in San Francisco Bay, another Mare Island first. But now the Navy had a ship built solely to carry and launch airplanes, the Langley, laid down at Mare Island. The creaky old biplanes of the 20s look almost ridiculous today, but in their time they were no laughing matter at all. The eyes of the Pacific fleet were extended hundreds of miles, and the bombs of the Langley's airplanes gave the fleet a long-range punch. But in 1930, the United States agreed with other world powers to reduce armament, hoping it would guarantee peace. The London Conference reduced naval tonnages to the bone. But using escape clauses in the treaty, some nations built up their naval strength while their rivals slept. Still, the United States kept its word. Many fine ships went to the scrapyard. Others, like the old battleship Brooklyn, were sunk by the guns of their sisters in the fleet. The 30s were depression years in America, and battleships cost money to keep in paint and powder. There were cutbacks at Mare Island, but a bright day came in 1933. The San Francisco was launched. Then, eight years later, Pearl Harbor. Once again, we were in it, up to our ears. No warning this time, just the brute fact of war. The Pacific fleet was hit hard, some of the ships gone forever, others wounded, gutted, bleeding, needing the healing fingers of the craftsmen at Mare Island. Mare Island was ready. The fingers had not lost their craft. This time there was war in the Pacific, right at Mare Island's front yard. The workers poured in on foot, in buses. They came in automobiles of every description, on motorbikes and bicycles. They came from all over, from every corner of the country. When a fire breaks out, everyone grabs a bucket. For the cripples were starting to come back from the Pacific, from Pearl Harbor from Midway, the Coral Sea, to be mended, refitted, rearmed, and put back to sea again. 88 other fighting ships like this one came to Mare Island for repair of battle damage during the Second War. More than 1,100 were overhauled. Ships are not like production line automobiles with interchangeable parts. Many parts are custom made. The work is fast, but always precise. 
topside damage is taken off. Radio reports on damage while the ship is still at sea help to speed up repair. Damaged parts like this searchlight go right to the shop. No time is lost. The repairmen know their jobs and do them quickly, skillfully. For there is a war to be won. The enemy that wrought the damage must be paid back 10 times over. Already, plans have been made in Washington for the first massive counter blows against Japan. This means ships, ships to fight, ships to convoy, ships to carry men and supplies. Every day a ship is away from the fleet is a day lost forever. And so the work goes on, around the clock. They work days. And they work nights, too. Every second counts. The Japanese won't wait. Ammunition comes aboard. The crew comes aboard. At last, she's ready, ready for action again. The Navy Yard has come through. Mare Island draws a deep breath. Then, it's back to work again. But by now, something new has been added. The lady. With most of the men at war and a shortage of skilled manpower, there were lady welders, lady painters, lady dye punchers, Ladies to do the grinding and the buffing. Ladies even painted signs for the guidance of other ladies. And ladies launched ships. Well, not always on the first try. But they got the job done, whatever it was. The work at wartime Mare Island was not unremitting. There were celebrities like Shirley Temple, Jack Dempsey. They came to sell bonds. And the workers of Mare Island bought more than their share. A visit from Frank Knox, Secretary of the Navy. Then, back to work. Bonds help, but there is still a war to be won. During the war, Mare Island built 391 vessels, a Navy in itself, including 31 destroyer escorts, five submarine tenders, a 19 fleet submarine. The building of ships has been a tradition with the engineers and craftsmen at Mare Island. Everything is carefully laid out in advance. The patterns are made from blueprints, then they are checked and double checked. Next, the metal is cut, a suit of steel for a modern submarine. Prefabricated sections are welded together. Everything must fit to the fraction of an inch. And it does. The submarine hull begins to take shape. The welders take over, and then the riveters. The rivets come out of the furnace red hot. Handling, passing, bucking and hammering hot rivets takes the sure hands of a big league shortstop and the brawn of a heavyweight champion. When the hull is ready, the engines are lowered in. The silent service has already begun to send enemy shipping to the bottom by the thousands of tons. In the largest machine shop in the West, three football fields long, the most modern equipment found anywhere is at work around the clock. Machine tools, weightlifting devices of every kind, boring mills, lathes, automotive equipment, Drill presses, turning out parts for every type of ship in the fleet. 
the sinews of naval strength have their beginnings here. Everything is tested, from armatures to propellers. There is no margin for error. Pride of workmanship, confidence in each other's skill, willing cooperation in each job throughout the work-heavy day. Call it esprit de corps, call it anything you like. Mare Island's craftsmen have it. And always, ships on and more ships built and launched. An integral part of any Navy Yard is its supply function. Huge stocks of equipment are kept on hand, ready to equip a new vessel or re-equip a damaged one. Supply is a meticulous job. There are requisitions to be processed, records to be kept. It is storekeeping in the nth degree, and everything is kept ship -shaped. There are guns for the fighting ships, and what is a fighting ship without a flag? And another ship slides down the way. To be fitted out, and made ready for the fighting fronts. Ordnance supply gives her the punch she needs, the punch to support a marine landing, to derail the Tokyo Express, or knock down a zero. Operations against the enemy had begun to step up. From the Marianas to Iwo Jima, from the Philippine Sea to Okinawa, the men, the ships, the planes put the pressure on, and they kept it on. The Japanese knew their number was up. They were beaten back toward their island empire. Their planes shot up in the air and sometimes on the ground. Their fleet mauled and broken. Their land forces wiped out or isolated. And their merchant marine sent to the bottom by the likes of the Wahoo, the Tang, the Silversides, and other Mare Island subs. Hiroshima clinched it. And on an August day in 1945, the battleship Missouri steamed into Tokyo Bay. Escorted by Mare Island built destroyer escorts, Crowley, Lehman, and Lake, to take the formal Japanese surrender. General MacArthur presided. Shigemitsu signed for the Mikado. MacArthur for the Allies. and the proceedings were closed. The war was won. The boys came home and the ships came home. The boys into civvies and the ships into mothballs. The deactivated fleet, 79 strong, had to be specially treated. Equipment had to be packaged and dehumidified. Everything about each ship had to be made proof against time and the elements but ready at any time to be broken out and put back to sea. The post-war days brought new scientific activity to Mare Island. A new electronics lab is being built, while the industrial lab continues its important work for the fleet. Mare Island creates its own formulas for the paint it uses and is on the search all the time for more efficient paints for its vessels. Another never-ending job of research at the industrial lab is the testing of rubber. Rubber for insulation, to absorb shock. Rubber that will stand up to salt water. Rubber that will take any kind of a pounding. And at the sheet metal shop, the habitability program is underway, making living conditions aboard ship more comfortable and more efficient. A newly designed table for a cruise mess has been created, made of light alloys and plastic tops. It seats four men in comfort, even style. Yet it takes up no more room than the old kind. 
Mayor Island believes that efficiency at sea goes hand in hand with good living conditions. Even with all our mothballing, the post-war United States Navy is still the largest in the world, and the ships of the Navy still need routine repair and overhaul. Mare Island is still on the job. The dry docks still hum with activity. Ships are gone over, from keelson to truck. The same skillful hands that kept them on the war fronts now keep the ships prepared for action at any time. Shipyard work is never done. There is always one more ship waiting. The war in Korea was hard on landing vehicles. The amphibious tanks used by the Marines to move from ship to shore. Mare Island tackled the job of putting these LVTs back into serviceable shape. They come to the shop from the battlefronts. Here they are reclaimed, repaired, and if need be, rebuilt. Then comes a thorough test. And quite a test it is. Marine experts see that they perform up to 4-0 standard in the water as well as on the land. This one seems to have passed muster. After the test, the LVTs are rechecked, painted, and sent to marine depots against the day when they'll be needed again. An old Mare Island specialty, the building of submarines, still goes on. A new idea in the construction of subs is now being tried out. With the approval of the Bureau of Ships, Mare Island is building a sub starting from the inside out, taking its needs and then building the submarine around those needs. Prefabrication is done in the shop. Section by section, the sub is put together, then brought down to the construction ways. This 60-ton section is lifted by giant cranes as easily as if it were a child's toy and swung into place. A new fleet submarine is on its way to completion. For crews of ships at Mare Island for overhaul, housing ashore is no problem. In neat Quonset units, sailors can stay with their families until their ships are ready for sea again. And the Mare Island Naval Hospital is still tending the sick, efficiently as always. And so ends a hundred years of history for Mare Island Navy Yard. The city of Vallejo, just across the Straits, marks this year's centennial with a magnificent exposition, calling to mind not only a century of partnership with the Navy Yard, but the beginning of another hundred years of service to the Navy. And the next hundred years at Mare Island will see its men and women, as they have been from Farragut's time onward, ever faithful to their motto, our sole mission is to serve the fleet. <laughs>